Hey everybody, I'm Lawson, and look at what I just found in the pantry. Triple stuff fudgeroos! Mine, all mine! Don't mind if I do. Anyways, in between cookies, I have a great story for you today. It's from this kid, Randall, who lives down the street. Now, Randall has been waiting months for the release of the Playbox Pro 7. And the whole time, he's worked extra hard earning money to buy it. No chore is too small or too hazardous. He's washed the dog and everything else. Randall's even packed lunches for his dad to take to work. Chef-worthy lunches. Randall saved all the money he's earned. So much money! Now he's got just enough for the play box. But when Randall goes to grab the play box picture off the fridge, he spots a new photo of Miriam. Now Randall's family sponsors Miriam so she can go to school and have enough to eat. And Randall realizes, hey, her birthday is next month. And Randall asks his dad, will Miriam get any presents? And dad says, not unless we send money for a gift. Randall stares at the play box and imagines how awesome it will be. Totally out of this world. Randall's worked so hard and he totally deserves it. But then he thinks what it would be like to have a birthday without one single present. And Randall asks his dad if he can send money for Miriam to get some presents. And dad says, sure. That's a great idea. Randall gives dad some of the money he's earned and together they send the money for Miriam's birthday. Then Randall and dad sing happy birthday to Miriam. Happy birthday to you. And even though Randall is a little sad he can't buy his play box right away, he knows that making Miriam's birthday happy was totally worth it. So kids, Always remember this, that humility is putting others first by giving up what you think you deserve. Hey mom, do you want any of these? Ooh, I thought you'd never ask. Perfect, we'll share this one. Mmm, thank you.
good. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Welcome to Story Lab. This week, we're talking about humility. Well, we take a look at an amazing letter written from prison. Hey, I'm Sebastian. And I'm Skylar. We're talking about humility, which is putting others first by giving up what you think you deserve. I think one of the best ways of putting others first is by helping them eat well. Mmm, like a box of fudge rounds. I was thinking more of tasty veggies. My relationship with vegetables is complicated. <laughs> How about this vegetable? Are you for real? Yep, world's heaviest carrot, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. That's going to need a lot of ranch. Then there's this. World's biggest cabbage? Yep. It's like part of some prehistoric jungle. I feel like we should see some dinosaurs roaming past it. Speaking of which... It's a Vegisaurus! <laughs> World's largest mixed vegetable sculpture. Amazing. Slightly terrifying. Our guest today knows a thing or two about veggies. He builds with them? Nope. He grows them. Great. I'm ready. Hi, Phil. We're so excited to talk with you. Hi, guys. Hey, it's good to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I run Sherith Farms, which is a small market garden that supplies an average of 40 baskets a week, all four seasons of the year, to our 65 families. Wow. What's your farm like? Well, it's a very intense little farm. It's a one quarter acre, if you do the math of how much we actually grow on. But we grow all major food groups. That's what makes a market garden a market garden. It has a variety of crops, a great diversity of crops, and we grow them all. Everything from broccoli and cabbage and beets and carrots and lettuce and kale and bok choy, onions and garlic, and a lot more. So, any watermelons? No watermelons. The watermelons would cover this entire garden. So, you have a special plan of what you plant? Absolutely. I can tell you what I'm planting next year and where I'm going to plant it. We rotate our crops every year into a new space. And so, ideally, the same crop isn't planted for almost eight years if I'm managing the garden well. Wow, that's a long time. Okay, it's easier on the soil and allows the garden to produce very well. A good garden is always giving back to the environment. So it's like you have to get to know your dirt. Yes, and that's where it really gets fun because in the creation story of Genesis, God tells the earth to bring forth vegetation. I'm always amazed at how the ground can adapt and respond to good care and love with such energy and life, like this. So farming is really a lot of hard work, right? I do work hard, but you know, everyone works hard. I get to choose the times when I work hard. All the vegetables you provide are such an amazing way to serve the community. Well, I'm glad I can do my part, but really, I'm only one gardener. In fact, that's how I sign my emails to my updates of my customers, one of you gardeners. How's that? Well, I love it when people come to my farm to pick up their produce for the week and they can see where it all comes from, and they can see the person who's actually involved. But in reality, most of our food comes from people that are laboring, whose names we don't know, whose stories we'll never hear, and they have to work under tough conditions. Wow, I never thought about that. Those people are out there in the dirt, they're working in the cold, they're working in the heat, they're working when it's raining, or they're working with the frost on their hands, maybe their gloves aren't working that day but they don't get to pick the days they get to choose. I feel like I should go find a gardener and thank them right now. Well, that's a great way to think about it. No matter what we grow up to be, there's always someone out there working in all kinds of weather conditions and living conditions to provide food for our families. I am so going to look at my food differently. I hope so. Well, thank you so much for being on here with us, Phil. It was a pleasure seeing you all, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye, Phil. Bye. I want a giant colorful salad right now. As long as there's plenty of this. <laughs> I love how Phil reminded us to pay attention to those growing our veggies behind the scenes. Yeah. Now it's time for... The Story Before the Story. Today, we're in Philippians, the 11th book in the New Testament. Philippians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the young church he started in the Greek city of Philippi. But before Paul 
way back in the beginning, out of a deep, deep love, God made an amazing world. But when people turned away from God, the world was broken. God made a plan to draw people back into relationship. So at the right time, God's very own son, Jesus, came to live among us. When Jesus grew up, he traveled from town to town, teaching and healing. But the religious leaders made plans to get rid of him. Jesus was crucified on a cross and died. But early Sunday morning, Jesus returned to life and lots of his friends saw him. Which is where our story starts. Hey everyone, I'm Chloe. Hi Chloe. For 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus spent time with his friends. Then he returned to heaven to be with God. But the news about Jesus spread. More and more people began to follow Jesus, including Paul. Paul traveled all over, starting brand new churches. On one of his journeys, he spent three months in the Greek city of Philippi, where he shared the news about Jesus with a businesswoman named Lydia. Lydia welcomed the new church to meet in her home, and it grew quickly, even after Paul was thrown in prison. Paul was released and continued his travels. Several more times, he was jailed for sharing about Jesus, but he used his time in prison to write letters to the new churches. In a letter from Rome, Paul encouraged the Philippians to put others ahead of themselves. Don't do anything only to get ahead. Don't do it because you are proud. Instead, be humble. Value others more than yourselves. None of you should look out for just your own good. Each of you should also look out for the good of others. As you deal with one another, you should think and act as Jesus did. Jesus is our model. Like the Philippians, we can begin to think and act like Jesus. So let's take a look at some of the things Jesus did. Jesus showed humility by always talking to God first. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. Jesus spent time alone with God, over and over. Jesus took time away from the crowds to ask God for help. He did it before starting his ministry, before choosing his disciples, and before giving up his life on the cross. Jesus submitted all his desires and plans to God. Next, Jesus showed humility by spending time with those who seemed unimportant. Come, follow me. Rather than choosing the most important, well-educated people to be his followers, Jesus chose the overlooked and the outcast. He wasn't worried about looking impressive. Jesus said to show humility by giving in secret. When you give to needy people, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Then your giving will be done secretly. That just means when you do something good for others, do it quietly. Don't make it a big deal and do it for show so people will think you're all that. Jesus also said to show humility in our relationships by doing more than is required. Suppose someone forces you to go one mile. Go two miles with them. Jesus taught that when you're told to do something, do it with a great attitude and then do even more than you have to. In the end, Jesus gave us the most incredible example of humility ever. Paul wrote, In his very nature, he was God. Jesus was equal with God. But Jesus didn't take advantage of that fact. Instead, he made himself nothing. He did this by taking on the nature of a servant. He was made just like human beings. He was humble and obeyed God completely. He did this even though it led to his death on a cross. Most of us will never be asked to actually die for someone. But every day, we can look for opportunities to set aside the things we want in order to put others first. Because Jesus puts us first. The end. Gotta be honest, this one is hard. Yeah, I mean, it's just so easy to default to what I want and what I need. That's right. It takes practice to pay attention to what other people need, and then to find ways of putting them first. So, what's our part in this story? Well, because Jesus put us first, we can live forever with Him. Instead of living for ourselves, we have the freedom to put others first, just like Jesus did. 
Just like how Jesus spent time with people who weren't considered important, you can look for the kid that's trying to make a friend instead of trying to get the popular kids to like you. Or like Jesus said to give in secret, you could quietly share a snack with a friend who doesn't have one and you don't have to make a big deal about it. When your mom asks you to take out the trash, you can take it out and then also empty the dishwasher, just like how Jesus said to go the extra mile. None of this is easy to do in our own strength. That's why it's so important to do something else Jesus did. Pray. Exactly. Jesus talked to God first, before anything else. When we take time to do that, we remember how amazing it is that Jesus put us first. Then God can give us the creativity and strength so that we can put others first. I think you've got it. See you next time. Bye, Bye Chloe. Chloe. So here's the thing. Put others first because Jesus put you first. Hey, let's go. Where are we going? We are gonna go help Farmer Phil. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. We'll see you next, next time. time. Let's go. Your love and kindness I will see